there is a Q&A section, uh, which is now switched on. And so we'd like for you to get involved in this conversation. And so please, uh, for the, tonight's conversation, uh, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, to ask your questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, during this presentation. We've also set the closed caption on for this evening so that everyone can participate. And so you'll see in the menu function of uh, your Zoom screen, uh, a CC section. Uh, and from there, you'll be able to control it yourself. Uh, and so I'm excited uh, to be here today uh, and talk about the film with an amazing panel. In the first part of the panel, I'll talk to the filmmaker and, uh, and the, the Reverend Liz Walker. And so I'm very excited to be uh, discussing the behind the scenes and some little known tidbits uh, throughout the movie and the film. And for the second part of the hour, we'll talk to some panelists to get a contemporary view of not only the film, the movement and what the Kings mean today. And so, uh, so excited. Please, please join in the conversation in the Q&A section. Uh, and I encourage you to ask anything that you want and uh, or almost anything, not, not, not quite everything. And I'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, to you the visionary filmmaker um, behind uh, this movie tonight. Roberto Mighty is a multifaceted artist, filmmaker, photographer, sound designer, and musician who uses interactive and online technology throughout his work. His immense interactive exhibition and artist talks take place online in museums, college galleries. Um, if you've probably seen something uh, around town, Roberto Mighty had his hand in it. Uh, he's built a brand new multimedia studio in Boston Fort Point Channel Arts District to facilitate creation, development, testing, and demonstration of new projects for museums and gallery installations. So if you were with me, I asked you to put your hands together, but you know what, we're, it's okay, we're in Zoom. Put your hands together <laughs> and please help me welcome Mr. Roberto Mighty. Welcome, Roberto. It's so glad, I'm so happy to see you. So happy to see you. Thank you very much, Amari. That was a great intro. I'm sure I can live up to that. I don't know, we'll see. Um, you know what, it was an amazing uh, opportunity and an honor to work on this project for two straight years, um, to work with these, um, all the people behind the scenes mostly the amazing seniors that, that you folks have seen in this movie. It was a dead run from the time, you know, I started working on this project to find these people, you know, to find them still whole and alive and ready and able to, to talk about what happened back in the 1950s before I was born. And um, they were just amazing. And their accomplishments made the, all the opportunities that my generation had possible, right? So. Um, at this point, I just want to say that um, thank you, Amari, Paris, Jeffries, and King Boston for being the visionaries behind funding my film and also the Boston Foundation. It's been a great two years working with you all, and you all have been totally behind it. Um, without further ado, though, I want to go on and um, really introduce someone whom many of us know and have known for years and loved and admired and honored, and that is Reverend Liz Walker. And I've you know, it's so funny. Uh, I had to, re you know, I read her bio, which is like pages and pages long. <laughs> oh, so I'm just going <laughs> to right. sort of get, get it down to just a few things. Um, you know, her career in television, she's won two Emmy Awards. She's won the Ed Edward R. Murrow Award. She's been inducted into the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. And after doing a story on the Lost Boys of Sudan, she reevaluated her life. She entered Harvard Divinity School. Of course, she aced that. And um, she's now the pastor of the Roxbury Presbyterian Church. And she, there could have been no better host for this project. I want to say she didn't just show up and be amazing as a host. She also was instrumental in, in nailing some of these interviews of some of these people who were kind of too busy to talk to. Who's this guy, Roberto Might? I don't know who he is. But when she would call, <laughs> forget about it. They just like fall into line. That was amazing. And it was, an, it was um, awesome to watch her, you know, to be to literally operating the camera and filming her, um, you know, getting these, pe pulling these people's stories out of them. Um, just a couple of really quick things behind the scenes. There's so many wonderful stories. One of the things I wanted to use as many of our talented local artists as possible. So those incredible illustrations were done by Carlos Byron, um, who lives in Roxbury, the wonderful voice uh, voiceover of the 
the, the old friend of Coretta Scott, that was uh, Diane Walters, a wonderful actress, also lives in Roxbury. Jonathan Singleton, a mm -hmm. minister of music at 12 Baptist Church, did that spectacular rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. He came to my studio and did it, and I'm telling you, I was in tears as he was playing. You know, um, so and there were about 100 people behind the scenes mm. um, who worked on this project. That was tremendous. Um, Reverend Walker, please, um, I just want to go to you right now. It was such an honor and a pleasure to work with you. Well, the honor was all mine, Roberto. To be a part of this was just amazing. And to watch you pull all of this together in your creative wisdom was really uh, a learning for me. I learned a lot because I have to tell you, I was a little... Uh, worried that we weren't going to be able to find all the people uh, because of course the the king generation is fading now yeah. and so to to find all these people and be able to talk to them and to, for their memories of course their memories would be intact but uh, about such an incredible man uh, but to watch you put this together was just a joy uh, yeah. and to have it be all Boston that was the other part that's right uh, you know to have all these people from Boston being a part of it so I was honored to be there Thank you. So Reverend Walker, I'd just like to ask, you know, uh, we had this wonderful, um, again, I learned so much from, from you and I don't want it to be all like- <laughs> Please. You know, I know exactly, <laughs> but I will say that- um, Hey, if you learned uh, a lot, imagine where I'm coming from. <laughs> I'm, my head's tipping over with all this wisdom, I'm getting <laughs> Right? Well, I, I wanted to, one thing I made clear in the very beginning, I did not have a religious background at all. However, though, I was aware that the Kings came out of a very strong Christian tradition. And I, I remember Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King, you know, I was, I'm old enough to have seen them um, live as it were. And I know that they came out of a powerful Christian tradition. And over the years, their public persona after, you know, they've, they've passed now, their public persona seems to have been separated from that very real philosophical religious context. Would you just speak to that for, for a moment, please? Well, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because when people talk about the Kings today, a lot of people connect them to socialism, a lot of people connect them to Marxism, a lot of people connect them to a political uh, kind of movement. But this movement came out of the church, no doubt about it. I was about five or six years old when Dr. King came to Little Rock, Arkansas, my hometown, to Arch Street Baptist Church. And my dad put me up at the balcony. My daddy was a preacher. And King was inspiring all these regular people that they could do something extraordinary. That was the, those are the people who marched. Those are the people who were <laughs> in front of the dogs. Those were the people with their children out there. So I don't ever want us to forget that the secret sauce of this movement was the foundation in the Christian church and, and everything else is wonderful. Gandhi is wonderful, but it was, it was faith that moved this, this movement and it was faith that grounded. That's fantastic. One of the things that I learned um, from the many scholars in the film, um, you know, Clay Carson at Stanford and Walter Fluker at Boston University and there are others, um, was that Coretta Scott herself comes out of a uh, philosophical uh, left-wing progressive background. She was, um, she attended socialist events. She gave uh, Martin a book on social, when he expressed how beautiful she was and how, how much he wanted to you know, honor her and marry her. She was like, yes, but please first read this book on socialism. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need to talk about anti-war stuff. You know, yeah. And in all those pictures of those marches, you see her holding the hand of who? Bayard Rustin, uh, a closeted gay black man. I mean, that influence that she had on him was incredible. And I didn't know any of that. I am so glad that we have done this uh, documentary, including her, because she was a powerhouse. And again, yes. all of her politics lined up with her face. She, she grew up in the, in the church too, but this was yes. all, it lined up. It didn't, it wasn't like something that was contradictory to what she was, you know, <laughs> as a child in some ways, though it sounds like it might be. But she was for, you know, the kind of this universal, all, all humans have value and worth in yes. the image of God, and we fight for that. So that's, that, was a, that was a good learning. I, I love the fact that she was a powerhouse. I love the fact that he had to kind of court her. <laughs> you <know>? Yes. Right. <laughs> oh, God, baby, this, you know, you're a nice guy, but I don't know. I don't know. Right. Right. You got to get serious. Are you kidding me? It was fabulous. Yeah, her, her, can you get her, serious? Her, her first impression wasn't that good, according to the right. film. So yeah. like, uh, no, no, no. 
I don't know. He's kind of short. She <laughs> might have swiped right. swipe right. left next time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, the funny thing is, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, um, Joelle Taylor, get Joelle Taylor at that time, uh, the only black woman in her class at Radcliffe College. She dated Martin and then um, another person in the film, uh, Herman Hemingway, dated her. And I can tell you this, everyone I spoke to who was a contemporary said, you know what? He was really good looking and she was really good looking. These were two vital, um, you know, energetic young people in the prime of their life who really loved each other. I mean, it was no joke. And uh, we didn't, couldn't get the rights to read Martin's famous letter to Coretta, but I urge everyone who's watching to go online and just look up Martin Luther King's romantic letter to uh, Coretta Scott. And it's mind boggling how incredibly beautiful yeah, and romantic right. that is. Well, ne next time, next time I'm in trouble, I might have to quote some of those King uh, <laughs> verses. <laughs> can't go wrong. The man you was a master. Wrong. You can't, can't, go, can't wrong. go wrong. Right. And Mari, uh, I just want to also add really quickly that in the context of their love story, here they are in a place where there's so many other warriors for justice. And I am glad yes. Roberto gave the due to people in Boston like Ruth Batson and like Jeep yes. Jones, who have always yes. been working for yes. justice, Sarah Ann Shaw, before the Kings came here. So that, that needs is, to be uh, uh, lifted too. And Roberto, I think that you did a great job in doing that. Well, thank you. And I have to say that um, I'm not from Boston originally, but I, I mean, I've come to, I've grown to love this place. But um, when I started asking people about the Kings, say, oh, no, 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 my brother, you got to hear about Jeep Jones. And you got to hear about so-and-so. You got to hear about Melnia Cass. I thought Melnia Cass was the name of a street. <laughs> My goodness gracious, I, I was schooled by a whole bunch of people who said, no, 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 you have to check out these people, you know, um, and that, again, was a tremendous learning opportunity for me. I think every filmmaker, we just love doing the research, you know, that goes into it. It's right. amazing. And, and Roberto, speaking of some of that research, do, do we know about, um, and this is one of the audience questions, uh, do we know about the role of uh, Coretta's family? Um, how did, did how did they feel about uh, Mr. King? You know, I did, that did not come up in my research. But let me say this: um, there's this other there's so many fascinating facets. And by the way, so many people are saying that they wish the film was longer. And you know, you only have but so much time. You know, um, but this thing could be. There's so much to learn and so much to know. And uh, later on, there will be more and more resources I know on the King Boston website and, and the uh, uh, coming up in your center that I know that you will speak to Amari, you know, at some point. But I will say this, that there was the, a significant class difference between Martin's family and Coretta's family. And this is very, people don't like to talk about this, but this is very, very real in every community and the black community is no different. Well, he, um, had, he, a, he, had, a, he had a car in the 50s. Right. He so, had a car. Brother was rocking a ride in the night in 1952. Right, a black a man with car. a car, a new car in the 50s in a Boston. A new car, a incredible. That's right. That he drove up from the south. Think about that, folks. Wow. Okay. Yes. And wow, well, right? Yeah. And so um, these are two very self-actualized individuals, very brave, very powerful. At any rate, um, she, as the film states, it's a fact. She was picking cotton as a child. Now, just imagine that. She goes from picking cotton in the deep south to being on the world stage, not only during um, her husband's lifetime, but of course, after his lifetime. She goes on for years and years and years and founds a powerful and vital civil rights organization. Imagine the power that she had as a young woman, because you talked about oh. the fact that he you know, drove a car. She came out of, well, she was in Antioch College, but I mean, right. to, to have the courage to come all the way up to Boston alone at that with no time, money. With no, no money. money. That, with was, no that money. was a pretty courageous woman. She had some, she came from good, good, strong stock. I don't know. <laughs> who was, but they she did. Powerful yes. people. Yeah. Yes, they were. That's right. Yeah. And her, um, her family is very, very powerful. Um, there are so many stories. Um, you know, her parents' house was burned down to the ground by a racist mob. Mm. Um, her father rebuilt the house with his hands. You know, and just kept on keeping on, you know, again, these stories are incredible. Um, I, 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 get, I have to say one more time that hats off and props to our um, elders and seniors who made all of this stuff that we're doing now possible. And that my, 
you know, my beautiful daughter who is watching right now, you know, all the stuff that's possible in her life that all comes from these people risking their lives and putting everything on the line um, to do that. And that's many lessons in that for today's people as well. Yes. And you know, there's another question I want to get to. It's an interesting question. You know, Reverend Walker, you, you had mentioned all the you know, the, the many, you know, Boston's legacy of uh, civil rights leaders, um, in, including the Kings, you know, we, we, we have this unique place in Boston of both uh, being able to authentically um, be engaged in part of the King's history, but also uh, have a myriad of leaders coming, you know, homegrown folks. You know, how does, how does that, that, that line up to what some perceive as Boston's racist history? Does it, does it change the way um, that we can elevate who we are as Bostonians, the stories like these um, help shape the narrative? I think indeed they do, but I think you have to remember that Boston's ha Boston has a, a pretty tough uh, reputation in its past. <laughs> Miss Woodson told us about going to school and how, how uh, segregated the schools were back in her day in the city and, and how you know she, they weren't getting a proper education then when she was growing up in Boston. So these warriors who came out, came out because they had to come out because Boston wasn't, Boston had written a check that it wasn't ready to cash. It, you know, it had mm. all had this progressive kind of attitude, but Boston was always pitting different groups against each other. And uh, Blacks came up in that and had to fight and scramble for what they, so when we talk about warriors, we're talking about people who made real change in this city. It certainly gives us a legacy of power and I think one thing we need to know uh, in this city now for these young activists is you have inherited this power. You're standing on shoulders of people who got you where you are. So don't forget that past uh, because it's important. And, 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 you know, I guess there's a question for both of you from the audience, but, you know, I've, I've been wondering this all along. Um, can, can we expect a legacy of love part two? <laughs> Um, and, and Legacy can we, of love, the sequel. <laughs> and, 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 and can you know? Can, can we expect uh, the the two of you to team up to to to, to see the next the next part of this um, and what it means for the city? Well, I, I, I would so many so many people have. Asked, first of all, I would work with Reverend Walker anytime, anywhere. She's incredible. Um, and so many people have been asking this, you know, who saw the film on Thursday night, um, have been asking this online on Facebook. Um, the truth is this kind of leads to my next question. I know that um, right now I'm over my head with um, having to deliver 26 episodes of two entirely new series to public television next year and, uh, and, and a lot of other projects. Congratulations, and Reverend That's Walker, amazing. thank you very much. Reverend Walker, would you please, um, what are you, what are you uh, up to these days? You know, what what oh, are you working goodness. on? Uh oh, everybody's <laughs> on the spot. On the spot, see? I, We're on live, I, I, live live Zoom. I got you both on the spot. No, I'm <laughs> as pastor of Roxbury Presbyterian Church, I uh, am a founder and uh, executive director of the Corey Johnson Program for Post Traumatic Healing. And so what we're doing is kind of taking the the I, I don't want to call it the underbelly, but one of the things that are ha that's happening in the midst of all of this. Uh, social justice movement is people's pain is coming to the front and and black people have pain from generations and uh -huh. our program deals with that kind of pain first because of the violence in our community uh racial uh, uh trauma historical trauma generational trauma so we work on that and that's been a real calling for me because we are uh, a people in pain and, and you can't celebrate yourself if you if you got it deal with those wounds. So that's what I'm doing right now. But I would work with Roberto under any circumstances <laughs> because of this vision. He had a vision and he saw it through and it was an honor uh, to be a part of that. Thank you. R Roberto, Reverend Walker, any, um, any last thoughts, closing remarks, things you want to share with the folks on online or, or joining us via Facebook Live or, or um, the GBH website? Well, well, do you mind if I just jump in Reverend Walker and let you have the last word. I just want to say that um, just really quickly, um, working on this film for two years, two straight years, every day of two years, um, has given me so much more inspiration in my own life to do what must be done, you know, uh, in so many ways. And I'm so proud of seeing, uh, I have to say, so many people, so many of my fellow citizens out there um, protesting and organizing for Black Lives Matter um, protesting, organizing for social justice. And I can't help but think 
that you know the the kings must be smiling looking down and smiling on all that activity mm -hmm. so i would just say folks keep on keeping on remember that history was always made by the people who stood up for what they knew to be right you know knew to be correct and proper and Reverend Walker, please, I'll send it over to you. Now, just to, to again, to say to you, Roberto, to bring the, the humanness in, you know, the human part, the human element of these giants, these icons was so important because we don't know our stories as people. Yes. We don't know our stories. Part mm. of our pain is because we have interrupted our, you know, our stories have been interrupted, our background. So to have yes. this as now a real story is huge. And I hope that as these young people continue to protest, more of our stories will come out because that is what frees us, is, is knowing yes. the story. It's, it's, it's part of the freedom. So uh, we just say, keep on keeping on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Th thank, thank you so much for being here this evening, uh, Reverend Walker. Uh, Mr. Mighty, I know you always correct me and say, call me Roberto, but <laughs> Sometimes you gotta you, you gotta give respect where respects do, and um, and we 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 are so honored to uh, have you here this evening and to to be able to share in this moment in this film. This is an important part of our history as a city and a country, and there's there's there hasn't been a greater moment in time for a movie like this to be present in in the in the public sphere. So thank thank you both for being here this evening. Uh, we, we are so honored to share this moment, and I know that we'll be seeing you both soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was uh, amazing. Um, two, two amazing folks who I, I, I have the honor and the privilege of um, calling mentors and, and speaking to on, on a normal basis. And so it's been incredible uh, to be a part of this as uh, executive director of King Boston. Um, I just want to um, remind you to ask questions via the Q&A section. Uh, we have another amazing panel coming up and uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this other second part of this important, incredible conversation. And so I'd like to invite our next panelist, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, you know, we, we bonded over uh, our first connection over Thai food, which, um, I, you know, maybe, maybe if you guys are nice and ask good questions, we'll tell you our secret Thai restaurant. Uh, that's Sheena Collier, who is the founder and CEO of the Collier Connection. So I'd like to bring Sheena on here this evening. And she's smiling because she's thinking about that Thai food. She, she texted me one time and was like, do they do delivery all the way over here? And I was like, I don't know, but tell me if they do. Um, and so the next person I'd like to bring uh, on um, here this evening is Reverend Willie Bodrick. And you, you saw him in the film earlier uh, this evening. Uh, Willie is a dear, dear, I would say old friend, but, you know, we, we both think of ourselves as young guys, but um, my, one of my oldest friends, he's the associate pastor at 12th Baptist Church. Uh, welcome, Pastor Bob Broderick. Great seeing you. And, and a recent graduate of North, Northeastern University, he is now a lawyer. So not only will he feed your soul, he'll feed your mind and, and, and uh, create all the good legal things for you. Welcome, Willie. Good to see you, Mark. My, uh, my other dear friend who I, I'm so glad to see uh, this evening, and I, I, I guess every, everyone's an old friend, uh, Reverend Mariama White Hammond, who is the founding pastor of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester. Uh, Mariama and I share many things in common, and I, I hear if you're, you're nice to her like I am, she will make you some homemade pickles to die for. My goodness, I had them on. Uh, a vegetarian burger this weekend and I was her ears must have been ringing I was singing her praises welcome Reverend White Hammond good to be here uh, next up we have Brandon Terry Dr. Terry is assistant Pro professor of African and African American studies and social studies at Harvard University uh, and a new old friend of mine uh, Dr. Terry, um, he doesn't know it yet. If, if you guys know me, I, I'm in a, a doctoral program and I am already Khan and Dr. Terry to be my one of my dissertation readers and advisors. So um, I, I'm, I'm trying to pay him in uh, high fives and praises. So I'm so glad to see you, Dr. Terry. Welcome this evening. Thanks a lot, Amari. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And, and last but not least, and I would say probably one of my, uh, you know, I've had to, the honor of 
uh, knowing Lisa Owens, who's the executive director of City Life, Vita Urbana, uh, probably the longest. I, I, and I don't want to tell people how long, Lisa, because then they'll know uh, how old we are. Because, you know, we like to think that we're young. Maybe we're young at heart. And so Lisa and I uh, co-founded the community fellows um, that used to be located at uh, BU and now at the Institute of Nonprofit Practice. And she's been a longtime activist and, and dear friend and say to me, uh, welcome Lisa Owens. Thanks Amari. And so let, let's get into it. We, we've just seen this amazing film, um, you know, and, and heard the conversation from Reverend Walker uh, and Reverend Mighty and so as we think about the movement today in a more uh, contemporary fashion, you know, I think I was reminded that uh, the Kings in this film were in their 20s, but throughout the, the, the 60s, they were only in their 30s. Uh, so they were, they were young folks. Um, what's, what's the role of, of young folks, uh, people in their 30s? What's, what's the role of uh, intergenerational leadership in, in the movement today? And let's, let's start with you, Sheena. All right, I wanna make, can you all hear me okay? I'm, I'm testing out some new headphones. Um, first, I just wanna say my heart is so full from watching that. Thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, even in the short time, I learned um, a lot, particularly more about Mrs. King's story and it, 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 I'm craving more of her story. Um, among the many things that were said, I think hearing about the class differences between them and particularly Coretta's lived experience, I can only imagine how much she actually shaped Dr. King's politics and I'm crazy, you know, I, I really wanna hear more about that. Um, I think particular for, first of all, thank you for saying people in their 30s are young, um, cause I tend to think of even younger folks um, who are leading movements. Um, but, you know, as a, uh, myself as a millennial, older, uh, ex-lineal, um, you know, I really even already am looking to those younger than me um, to take my cue from them to really help me understand uh, what, what are the things that I should be advocating for and leading on? Because I think, you know, just the reality is as we get older, as we have more responsibilities and more things that we are um, tied to, um, we, we may be less willing to take risks or um, kind of speak out on certain issues. And so, you know, I love that they were here at this prime time in their lives. I love that it was highlighted that they were um, two people on these separate but parallel paths who were focused on mm. individual missions and somebody recognized that they could have this power together. Um, and, and Coretta even made it clear, like, I'm not trying to be a traditional kind of pastor's wife. We have this shared social mission. And I think that um, for young people now who are leading these movements, um, it's really important for us to give them um, kind of the foundation and uh, follow them and let them lead um, because they are seeing things, they're experiencing things that we might not be experiencing any longer. Um, or for those of us in their 30s, you know, those older than us are not experiencing the same things. And so it's really important for us to keep this intergenerational conversation going because at just the, the fact of the matter is at different parts in your life, you care about different things. And, I, and I'm going to jump in there with some, with some audience questions as well. You know, I'm going to go to you, Reverend Broderick. Um, think, thinking about the film, and you, you, you had um, a cameo in the, in the movie a few times, and so it was great to see you there. Uh, do, do, you th do you think race relations has changed much in Boston today? Uh, thinking about what the Kings were experiencing both in the 50s, when they returned in the 60s, uh, until to today. Um, what's, what's different? What's the same? Uh, well, thank you, Amari and I, and I want to give great credence to Roberto Maiti, as well as to Reverend Liz Walker for their amazing work in navigating this film. Uh, it's important to understand, um, you know, the Kings come to Boston during the peak of the Great Migration. I mean, from 19, probably 1920 to about 1950, you see almost a 30,000 person growth in the development of Boston's Black community. And so, you know, you see the budding transition of Black Boston continue to grow and develop and continue to take a different movement. Um, you, we, we cannot honestly say that the, the change and transition isn't different than today because we do know it's different in many ways. However, I think many of the issues, uh, issues around housing, issues around police brutality, issues around education, and various issues that continue to uh, present themselves within the, the gaps and the disparities between communities, particularly from white to black communities are very present. 
Uh, we know that you know the net worth of a family in Boston is drastically different. Uh, we're talking almost eight dollars to two hundred and forty-one thousand dollars in between a white family and a black family as it relates to net worth. And so we do know that there are very present and very real realities, and the impressions of Black Boston. Um, as it relates to white Boston are still very present in the realities of how we are continuing to try to strive towards creating equity in this city. And so uh, we know that the Kings were trying to process and understand how to be best in presenting justice and thinking critically about how do we present their best selves and understanding how social movements and institutions um, engage with one another to create some type of justice and equity. And today we're still trying to figure those realities out today. And, and as we're dealing with the global pandemic, as we're addressing you know, racial disparities across the board, we're trying to do the hard work of continuing to create equity in our communities. Uh, and and I, I want to make sure that we under, understand the undercurrents of the Christian ethos at the foundations of their ideals and their beliefs and how that continues to perpetuate itself um, and, and the movements today. And so we're, we're very excited. I'm very thankful to be a part of this film, thankful to be a part of this project. But I'm very clear about the fact that the Kings were addressing many of the issues that we're addressing today. And, and you know, that, that faith-based ethos is, is important to raise up. And so when, when we think about it today, is, is it the same? Um, do folks rely on um, a faith-based ethos uh, in the movement? Uh, Reverend White Hammond, re respond to that, please. I definitely think there is spirituality. I think that people have, um, are grounding themselves, but I do think that the, the black church is not nearly as central as it once was. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think that the black church at a lesser rate, but still quite frankly, um, the same as the Christian church overall in the United States um, is, is losing its relevance to young people. Um, and so I think there is a moment, this is a time for the tradition to ask some real questions about where it is and where it wants to be going. So I, I don't think you can say it's the same. I think um, most of the folks in, many of the folks, not all, but many of the folks who are leading the Black Lives Matter um, movement today don't go to church regularly. Um, and I think we need to name the fact that one of the, one of the core reasons, one of the most challenging um, conversations within the black is around the black community and the black church is around LGBTQ acceptance within the black church. Um, the black church has long held a don't ask, don't tell. Um, many folks know, you know, folks who are LGBT, but we said, oh, you need, you can come to church, but just be closeted. And it's come to a point where folks don't wanna be closeted anymore. Um, and I don't think they should have to be. As one of uh, a, a pastor of an openly affirming congregation, I will tell you that many of the Black folks who come to our congregation come because they've left somewhere else because um, they said they just couldn't do it anymore. And that's not just you know LGBT Black folks. I have a lot of straight congregants who said, I just couldn't be there because I felt like we weren't being um, honest, we weren't keeping it real. So there's some real conversations. I don't think it's past the point um, that those conversations could happen, but no, I don't think the black church is nearly as central um, to current movements as it has been in the past. Dr. Terry, re respond to that. And then I wanna go to you, Lisa. Um, well, I think one of the things we always have to remember when we're talking about past analogies is that you've got a different structure to the American racial order. One of the reasons that the church is so powerful in the Southern wing of the civil rights movement is that people have no other political representation, right? Um, Bayard Rustin, when Dr. King decided to move to Chicago in 1966 to try to organize against the slums in the city, warned him that part of your popularity is based on something really quite terrible, which is the disenfranchisement of this whole mass of people in the South. So one of the things we are noting is just a broader transformation of American politics and that the sources of political authority and black life are coming from lots of different directions. That's a good thing. The question is how do we navigate that 
and appeal to the good things and the, and the powerful spiritual resources of the church, even while it no longer holds the vanguard position. Lisa, I'm, uh, I'm jumping there, and, and, and you know, and I think t talk a little bit about um, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the work that you're doing on, on the movement building. Um, you know, ha is there a um, a more integrated faith-based component to it? Are are folks feeling like um, you know church and, and faith-based uh, the faith-based ethos it hasn't been a part of the movement? And, and, and what are you seeing? Yeah. Um... Amar, if it's okay, I'm going to answer another question because our, our work actually um, uh, doesn't intersect with, with faith-based movements as much as some of my other esteemed colleagues. But, you know, I actually just wanted to make some, um, draw some parallels between that time and this time because I actually see, um, I, I actually see a lot of hope in the parallels. So, you know, some things that struck me were, you know, at the beginning of the film, we, we heard a list of, of, what the, of what the material conditions were like in Boston. You know, Boston was right um, in the middle of urban renewal. Boston was um, suffering from the impacts of redlining um, and segregation. Um, and, and there's this movement for economic justice, burgeoning, right? Um, so, so so King and Coretta Scott, so both Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King come into Boston during this time of, 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 of social movement, right? And they're leaving and they're, they're coming from places that themselves have histories, traditions of social movement, of organizing. Um, and Coretta Scott King specifically, I loved hearing that she was a socialist. I didn't know that. Um, I loved hearing that she had teachers that trained her in a particular political ideology that she brought with her into Boston, right? And so she's coming into this, into this time um, with you know, having her teachers sort of in her ear and she's making sense of the moment. And, and we see this now. We see uh, the same issues. We're dealing with the impact of, of things like redlining and urban renewal, the destruction of working class communities and we're seeing the same, the, the same class, right? So, so black working class folks, sharecroppers, folks that, that were escaping things like lynching during the great migration coming up to the North. We see the same class of people being the moral center, the political center of these uprisings now. Now our lynching is, uh, is police violence, state violence against black people. So the very same class of people are at the heart of this uprising that has over that, that has become the heart of uprising across the country. We're seeing, as as always in our in our in our nation's history, the the, the movement for the dignity um, of Black lives being the heart of the of many 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 movements for social justice. So I just love seeing that parallel. Sheena, can you, can you respond, jump, jump in here and, and give some insights on, on that parallel to you. You and, you and I have, have had you know, may, many conversations of, you know, as newcomers to Boston about what we see. Um, so you know, there's this uh, story tells a history that many of us who are not from Boston don't understand and, and we come into a perspective um, from, from a different place. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the main things I thought about watching it and watching this and just as I continue to learn more about Boston's history, and this is from someone who's been here for 16 years and is still uh, learning all the time, particularly around the rich black history here, is that if we both, you know, in Boston, um, but definitely outside of Boston, knew that history more and how much of a leader really in civil rights uh, Boston was, I think that the work that many of us on this call and others in the city are doing would we could frame it more as a rebirth rather than feeling like we're trying to create something new. And I think that that is the, the feeling, particularly for transplants and, and uh, maybe even for folks from here sometimes who, who don't know the history as well, you feel like you're trying to, we, we all have this narrative that we've been told about Boston um, and its place in history that's very white. And so when we're doing 
So, you know, I have my membership, Boston Wild Black, where I'm bringing together uh, both native Bostonians and transplants who want to build community. But the more that I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm revitalizing something that already existed, you know, I'm not starting from scratch and creating something totally new. That's actually way more affirming to me because it, it gives me more hope around what I can actually do here and what I can do in partnership with others because the, there's, there's already fertile ground in Boston for it to happen. And so I love these kind of stories. I mean, I really, I said it, my heart is really full from watching this because I think, um, you know, just like last year I traveled to Ghana, like the more, the more we understand where we're coming from, you just feel more affirmed in your work and it feels more possible. And the, and the things, the barriers feel more temporary um, because you know that others have done this before you. And so I, I love the parallels that Lisa is drawing and um, want to continue to bring this type of information um, to the forefront, particularly for younger black people who may feel hopeless and despair, who may feel like they're fighting systems that don't care about them, which, which is true, um, but really understanding that they are moving forward the work of others, that they're not starting from nothing. Mm -hmm. Reverend Project, jump jump in here. I saw you affirming uh, with, with your eyes and head, giving us an, you know, the, the double does jump in. <laughs> I, no, I think Sheena captures uh, a very important aspect. I mean, I'm very blessed to be a part of the 12th Baptist Church tradition. I mean, I stand upon the shoulders of Matthew A. and Shaw. I stand upon the shoulders of William Hunter Hester and Michael Haynes and Arthur T. Gerald, Jeep Jones. I mean, the, the interconnectivity of our history in Boston uh, is, is not anything that is just new. It doesn't just spawn on anything. It's why I was so excited to hear Liz, you know, Reverend Liz Walker talk about that because so much of the groundwork has been laid. When you think about a male king and a male Nia Cass, so many people have done this work and we're not doing new work. And I think that's very important for us to acknowledge. There are different iterations. And I think Mariama White Hammond speaks very clearly to that, that the black church, I mean, we have to think critically on, I've seen some questions around how is the religious tradition, you know, Reverend J.H. Jackson of the National Baptist Convention is pushing back against King at this moment, you know, uh, and I think Brandon could speak very eloquently to this. You know, there's a pushback from the National Baptist Convention to the to the civil rights movement and the various iterations of the ways in which this movement is spawning in American history. And so we're seeing this kind of friction between this intergenerational, you know, framework that we're seeing very present today. You know, what I mean that. You know, the black church isn't the quote unquote vanguard as, been, as it's been spoke of, and it never really has. But there have been people who have been people of faith who have thought critically about how do we continue to recreate and watch this reimagine the ways in which we see freedom, liberation and justice. And I think that's what we're hearing today. There are people of faith who are young people who are still thinking critically. And I think many of the people on this panel today are some of those people who are thinking critically about how do we reimagine the next step? How do we reimagine the future? And though it may not be captured as a faith movement, it is captured as a justice movement. And we're very excited to be a part of that work. So that's why I'm nodding my head. I'm excited about where Boston's future is going. And I'm excited about the work that we'll be doing together as we move this city forward. Well, you know, and as, as youthful leaders, do, do you find Boston is forgiving? Um, not, not only as youthful presenting, and I see Mariama laughing, giving me the smile, but as useful presenting black leaders. And so like, how, how do we reconcile Boston as a city that, that's known to be um, parochial in one, one nature? Um, un, unfriendly is, is one of the other titles that the city has been given um, and unfriendly to black groups. Um, how, how, do we, how do we square that circle? Um, Brandon, jump, jump in on that and then, uh, and then to you, Reverend Whitehannon. Yeah, well, as somebody who grew up in Baltimore, um, it's stunning to see the differences uh, in a place where people are not used to Black folks wielding power, being in charge, where they're not used to taking direction or taking leadership or acknowledging leadership of Black people. I just didn't grow up in a city like that. Uh, and that there's many things that are hard to wrap my head around. There, there are lots of things I love about the city. I've made it my home. My wife was born here. Uh, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, but that part of it is very, very hard to adjust to as somebody who, like many of you, like the Kings themselves, came to the city 
uh, out of a sense of ambition, out of, a, uh, out of trying to make something of myself, trying to do something excellent in the world. And to meet with that discouragement around the city, I think is a huge problem. One of the things that I'm really excited about that, that I think could be a real shift in the culture of the city is the recent appointment of um, my classmate at Yale, Carolyn Crockett, uh, to, to be the chief of equity for the city. Uh, and she's somebody who I think is well aware. She wrote a fantastic book about the struggle against um, the highway placement in Boston and slum clearance in, in Boston, Negro removal, as they called it. Uh, and so she's somebody who knows this is not coming. This is not a struggle that's new. She's informed by the, the demands of the past and understands deeply how the questions of wealth, education uh, and and. and racial justice are all tightly tethered together here and will either make life livable or will make the city fall short of the ideals of freedom it supposedly encompasses. Well, I think um, I wanted to weigh in because as somebody who grew up here, but who's married to someone who did not grow up here, this is a constant um, conversation in my house. There are, there's Boston uh, stuff and there's Detroit stuff all over our house, uh, uh, in, sometimes in tension with each other. Um, you know, I think I've, this se I've seen that tension. Yes. <laughs> it sometimes um, it's comedy gold. My, my, <laughs> my husband grew up in Detroit. He grew up in Detroit at a time where black folks were coming into power in Detroit and, and he does, he, con he sharply contrasts his lived experience um, with the reality of growing up here. And I also wanna own that as far as privilege goes, I may be one of the more privileged black people in this city um, in, the, in the sense that my family has been here for a long time and um, you know, I'm, I am known, right? Um, and so I think um, the, the reality is also complex. I think there are times when um, I feel like I see the reputation that Boston has and I'm in other places where I'm like, I'm experiencing some similar dynamics here. And I think a lot of, uh, a, a good chunk of this can be partially ascribed to an insider outsider piece. Um, there is a way in which you, when you grow up here um, and because there's so many people who come for here for school and so many people um, who come to the city, um, there can be a way in which those of us who've been here already um, sometimes can stick with other folks who've already been here. And that's not just white folks. That's, I think that's also true um, mm -hmm. with, with black folks too. Um, I do remember sort of when the students would come and feeling like uh, they just overwhelm our city, right? And so there's, there are a number of layers of um, that tension. Um, but I say this as someone who grew up down the street from Gopal. I remember um, when our murder rate was, um, comparable for a city of our size to many other places that people um, would say were really challenging. And I lived across the street from Sarah Ann Shaw, the first um, black newscaster. So I think it's a story, the city has a story of, of um, both ways in which people have been held back and ways in which people have, go have gone ahead. And I think my only frustration is only one side of that story has, is often told publicly and externally, um, and as somebody who's lived here and grown up here. Like I remember Lisa and I bumped into each other as high school students back in the day as part of um, black led and black supported programs for young people. Um, and so I think, again, the story is more nuanced than what you hear. Um, and, I, and I think that's important to recognize because I don't think if um, it was only one way that you would have the kings. Uh, that is a part of our history, a part of our story. There has always been folks like Elma Lewis. I remember learning piano and my sister violin with a class of all black kids, right? Um, so there, there are multiple stories of black Boston and I, I wanna caution us um, not to fall only into one um, because I think that it allows us to be reduced in a way um, that I'm, I'm not interested in participating in wall. I still acknowledge there's a lot mm -hmm. of inequity and we've got to deal with that. Um, there are major wealth gaps and um, there is also um, in, in many statistics and things you'll find that 
Black folks are doing sometimes better than their counterparts or poor Black folks are doing better than their counterparts in other places. What we do not have is this burgeoning middle class that um, is so uh, distinctly separate. And that's um, what I would say, my friends would say in Atlanta or other places where you have Black folks living in gated communities. We, we actually don't have quite the same level of division um, between um, I think Black middle class and Black working class communities. There's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of room um, for growth, but I do want to nuance um, the story just a bit. So, so Lisa, yeah. how do we reconcile that inequity? Or, or do we yeah. not? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I so appreciate um, having lots of opportunities to nuance the conversation about, about who we are as Black people. You know, one of the one of the stories that I think kind of gets um, told in one way is the story of Black resistance um, and this um, connected to a certain kind of, of violence. So very overt. You know, we all know the story of the dog. You know, um, you know, mauling our ancestors. We we know the story of the lunch counter. Uh, but do we do? But do we know about the training? that those people received, right? So, so for example, it, it's, it's actually not a coincidence that Coretta Scott had, um, had socialist teachers, had communist teachers. The history of the Communist Party in the South is actually, um, is, is actually a beautiful story um, where we, and it's a story of, of the people who, are, who were the most impacted by violence at the time, looking at the very real class, uh, the, the interests of, of the elite that, that owned the businesses, the churches, the this, the that, there, there was a reason beyond race that our people were, were kept in the field. And so this consciousness, this class consciousness did follow us into Boston. It followed, and, and it came through my family, right? So, so that when I'm a young person in the 80s, I'm part of a youth group where Mariama bumped into me. Um, she's at a different youth group at the Freedom House. But I'm part of the youth group where the elders in my community are talking to me about the Black Freedom Movement. And they're talking to me about communism. And they're talking to me about, about what is class. And they're talking to me about why we have inequality in the first place, right? So we have to look at how wealth is created. We have to look at how poverty is created, and all of this to say now, we are in a moment, um, certainly, um, uh, and this, the tip of the spear is the movement for Black Lives, but we're in a moment now where people are, are for the first, or not for the first time, but for right now, saying there's actually another way. Actually, we don't have to choose an economic system where our people are always on the bottom, and where a handful of people can kind of eke out a middle-class existence. We actually can choose another way. And so there are lots of examples in the movement for Black Lives um, where people are talking about alternative institutions, community land trust, alternative ways of, of looking at economics that, prop, that, that centers um, human development and human needs and community needs over profit. Um, so that's, that's a story, that's a black story that I'd like for us to be talking about. And so, it, it, you know, in, in that black story, you know, how, what, how do we also have an honest conversation about patriarchy? You know, how do we, or, or raise up non-binary folks in our community? You know, what's, you know, what's, what's that part of the story in, in this moment of now? And, you know, I think Willie, Reverend Broderick brought it up and, and Reverend Hammond about, you know, creating seats at the table for all of us Black folks simultaneously. And I think I'm backing on, on what you're saying, Lisa. Um, Willie, jump in there and, and, and talk a little bit more what, what you were talking about, and then we'll go to Dr. Terry on this. No, I, I, think, I think it's important to think critically about what does this reimagining look like. Um, you know, like Brandon, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, so I'm from outside of the city, but I'm from the same city that Dr. King was raised in. So I understand the ethos and the culture that shapes him in Southwest Atlanta, Georgia. And I understand how that frames what we think critically about, but I also understand the nuance of the ways in which faith had kind of, you know, created a 
a, a chasm between thinking critically about both women and their movement, their place in the movement, but other people, right? The otherism that existed within the frameworks of these movements of quote unquote progression. And so I think what we've, we're seeing is this form of reckoning um, that Lisa is speaking about, not only from a class perspective, but also from a, a gender perspective, a sexuality perspective of how do we reconcile the reality that we have to create more space at the table. I think it's Michael Curry that speaks eloquently and says, you're not, if you're not at the table, you're, you're on the menu, right? And we think critically about how do we create more space at the table? And so I think one of those things is, is revisiting our ethics, revisiting our values, what do we really mean by liberation? And I think many a times we have a very myopic scope towards what it means to liberate people, right? And rooted in, for me, the deep intrinsic work of the cross is a liberation for all people. And so I think what we're having to do and what the black church, what our community writ large, even those who do not ascribe to Christian values are still reconciling with this reality of how do we identify ourselves as people who are about the liberation of all. And that liberation frees us from capitalism, frees us from patriarchy, frees us from sexism, frees us from homophobia, frees us from these very isms that I've had many a times have been impediments towards our overcoming, right? We say we shall overcome. Now those have been the hurdles to our overcoming. And I think right now we're in a critical moment as we think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others who have been affected by state sanctioned violence, but also affected by the very isms of our society presently. We've been pushed towards this moment to think critically about what does that mean? How do we manifest that? And how do we come together to create a world that is better create an America that is better for it. And I think that's what we're doing. And that's the work that we all have to work towards from academia to, you know, to faith-based spaces, to social spaces, also to the work in which we're doing in capital and in our capital spaces and business spaces as well. If we, if we were at the Apollo, I, I could hear Sandman or, or there's a few reverends on this call today. So I, I hear the organ um, slowly playing in the background, which I know is our cue to start wrapping up. And so y'all smiling because y'all hear the organ too. I'm not the only one here in the organ. We're about to, we're about to end this. And so I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to, 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 to Sheena and, and, and maybe we're gonna give everyone one minute final, final words, thoughts, uh, reflections on the, on the film and how it relates to the contemporary movement. Start with you, Sheena. All right, well, um, something that has been on my mind this is, I'll use this, just make this my last word. I thought about it when Mariama was speaking about the nuances and, and Lisa mentioned it as well. And I think that this film um, does a good job of lifting up some of that. You know, when people call Boston the most racist city in America, you know, for those of us particularly that are not from here, but probably even ones that are from here, black people in other places ask you why, you're, why you are here, why are you here? Um, and really wonder because of the narrative that is, um, you know, very prevalent. And I, my, what my answer has shifted to, rather than answering is Boston the most racist city, because um, the United States is the most racist, um, is more, I think the issue here is the erasure and invisibility of black people in our stories. And that is a, a big piece, a big reason why someone like me who's from Albany, New York, who came here for grad school, didn't think that there were black people here before I moved here, definitely didn't know the history civil rights history of black people here. Uh, and so I think that if, you know, in all of the, the work that we're doing in this film and hopefully the sequels to this film, um, being able to continue to lift up that, the real, the nuanced, the varying stories of black people who are from and have come through Boston and continue to build in Boston um, will, will make us all stronger as a community. And again, again as I said earlier, give us um, more of a foundation to, to build off of um, and recognize that um, we're here, you know, and that's a lot of the work that I am continuing to do is, is really just shine a light on the fact that we're here. Um, and, and I think in this movement and movements of past, a large piece of it is we just want to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Uh, Reverend Broderick. I think what I'm encouraged by is that the film Legacy of Love reminds me is that we are in a space of constant incubation and that we have an opportunity to reshape and recreate not only the status quo, 
but the future in which Boston will become. And so I'm excited to be a part of this legacy, um, these conversations, this capturing of history so that we continue to work towards this reshaping and this reimagining, reimagining of what is to come and hopefully it is a better future for not only ourselves, but our posterity. Thank you, Reverend Broderick. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, um, so we, so I'm, I'm thinking of the, fa of the fact that the Kings were, were taught by people who, who lived through the Great Depression and their politics were shaped by the, mm. the, the, the material suffering of the entire nation. We, and we are the legacy of this, of, of this generation. We are at the beginning of the second Great Depression. If you look at unemployment numbers, if you look at, at the, all of the economic and health insecurity um, due to the global pandemic, we are in a similar watershed moment. And we are called on to create new to, to recreate this country anew in the same time that our ancestors did in the 30s and the 50s and the 60s. So I want to be part of that new revolution. And I'm guided by the, the amazing Black women who I think are the legacy of the Kings, all of the activists that are part of City Life Movement and Boston's anti-displacement movement. Um, and I really encourage everybody watching to, to join us because housing, I think, is, is the next big thing for Boston. Dr. Dr. Terry. Well, I just think coming out of this that you have to have a lot of profound respect for how seriously the Kings took the life of the mind, how they understood that the problems that they confronted were not problems that could be solved without serious thinking, without serious study in community with each other. Uh, and so I just encourage everybody to, to read them, read their words, understand why they came to advocate for guaranteed jobs, why they came to advocate for basic minimum income, why they were critics of capitalism. It's not just enough to say, well, Kings had socialist leanings, understand what they thought the shortcomings of that system were and what they thought might resolve it. Um, those ideas I think are very, very crucial for us navigating the problems of our time. And it's, it's wonderful to see their legacy brought to life in that way. Hey, Dr. Terry, uh, Reverend White Hammond. So I think um, that I'm, first of all, I just want to say I'm thankful for the film. I think it is, a, the fact that so few of us knew this history, I think, again, illustrates um, that we, find ourselves in dangerous territory because we don't know our history. And so that is part of why we continuously repeat it. And so I think, you know, this question of where we are um, is so deeply connected to um, the fact that so often we have reduced the Kings to these iconic images. We don't know them. Um, they were ever evolving people. And that is what Dr. King and Coretta would want for us to be not to be stuck in time, but to be aware of our past, to constantly really be engaging with where are we called to next. I think one of the most beautiful things, and I, I do sometimes get frustrated that people over um, romanticize the I have a dream speech, but what was really powerful about that is that Dr. King was saying, I have an imagination for something that is beyond this. And I think far too often we are limiting ourselves to what exists now and not thinking big enough, not dreaming big enough about where we should be headed. And I completely agree with Lisa. We are in the midst of a pandemic, a racial uprising, our climate is collapsing. More than ever, now is the time for us to dream about something beyond what we are experiencing now. That is the legacy of the Kings. And we see that that tradition started even when Dr. King had the gumption to tell Coretta she was gonna be his wife on the first date. That was about a man and a woman who were dreaming into a future that they could not see. And quite frankly, they didn't live to fully realize. That's our job. And I hope we um, will all lean into the kind of powerful, loving, thoughtful uh, and inquisitive relationships and communities that will be required 
to not just have a dream, but to live it, um, to bring it to fruition. Thank you. Wow. Wow. It, it is such a, an honor and a, and a pleasure to be with you all, Sheena, Willie, Brandon, Lisa, Mariama. Um, I, I am so fortunate uh, to call you friends of mine and um, you, you can expect some, some love and blessings. I'm going to send you love and blessings through the mail. Amazon package full of love and blessings. Th thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the, the wonderful leaders who tuned in to the movie and to this conversation today. Um, we are in the middle, and I think many, many of our panelists have, have said so, um, three pandemics. And so th the greatest gift we can all give is presence uh, and love. And so thank you all for, for spending your time with us this evening. Thank you to our wonderful, wonderful team, Natisha, Jen, uh, WGBH, the Boston Foundation, for being amazing sponsors and supporters um, of this day uh, and, and the film. Thank you to the magnificent Roberto Mighty, who had the vision uh, to dream about what it would mean to tell the story of the Kings. Uh, and not only for telling the story for the storytelling sake, but to remind us of our complex history as Bostonians and our relationship with each other. Thank you to the ever powerful and mighty Liz Walker, Reverend Walker, for being here this evening and being a host. And we look forward to you and Roberto teaming up um, for part two. And for those of you who are on, uh, who are participants, uh, the legacy of love is a part of King Boston, which as some of you may know, uh, is a three-part uh, initiative in the city. It's the Embrace Memorial to honor both Coretta and Dr. Martin Luther King in the Boston Common. It is a plaza to commemorate the civil rights leaders of Boston, also in the Boston Common and is the King Center for Economic Justice located in Nubian Square, uh, which is an action and think tank designed to fulfill the promise of the Kings and create a space for us to all imagine a better tomorrow. Thank you all for being here this evening. We are so, so honored to have this conversation. Thank you to my dear friends. You probably would hear clapping. I hear 100, 200 people clapping in the background, or at least I don't know, they turned your mics off. Uh, it, it's been an incredible evening and um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening, friends. Thank you.